right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my tech talk. My name is Musin, and I'm a full stack engineer. I'm originally from Italy, and I moved back. I moved to Japan back in 2014. So this is my seventh year now in this beautiful country. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about uh, memory management in general first, and then a little bit more specifically uh, about how it's managed in JavaScript. So let's jump right into it, shall we? So before we go into how JavaScript memory uh, works, I would like to take a couple of minutes to talk about how memory is and how it's managed. Uh, what, it, what does it mean to manage it in the first place? So what is memory? Memory is any physical device capable of storing information permanently or temporarily. Memory comes in all forms, shapes, and formats. We have hard drives, we have USB drives, we have memory cards, CDs, uh, ROM, read-only memory, or RAM. And in the context of memory management, when we refer to memory, uh, we mean RAM. So throughout this uh, presentation as well, when I say memory, I will be referring to RAM. So what is RAM? Well, RAM stands for random access memory, and it is essentially the short-term memory where data is stored as a process needs it. It usually contains the operative system and the graphical user interface and any currently running applications. So to use an analogy here, if you were a process, if I was a process running currently running, the RAM would be your desk, would be our desk, and you would be bringing all the tools and resources that you need to perform the task to your desk before you perform the task. So any variables, any arrays, any functions, you bring them to your desk, and then you start performing the task. So what is memory management then? Memory management is about making sure that any currently running program is only using the amount of RAM that it requires and no more than that in order to leave as much memory available as possible for new programs. And the reason for that is surprise, surprise, memory is finite and it is shared between multiple processes. So to go back to our analogy, if we, um, so since we are processes and memory is shared, that means that we don't really get to have a desk for each one of us. We have one big desk that gets split into chunks and it gets allocated to each one of us. Depending on the task that we have, some of us might have a bigger desk, a bigger chunk of desk. Some of us might have a smaller, uh, smaller chunk of desk. And that's okay, as long as we are requesting and using exactly the amount of memory that we strictly need. So how is memory managed? Depending on the language that the process and the program has been written in, memory will be uh, managed differently. Some languages give you the tools to allow you as a developer to be very strict with how you manage memory, while others do it automatically for you. An example of languages that allow you to, do, uh, uh, to manually manage memory is C or C++ or Rust. Um, these, these languages have specific functions that allow you to allocate a certain amount of memory when you need it or free it up when you don't need it anymore. And if you were to visualize this step here, that's the very strict memory management, um, it would be as if you were working on a task uh, using your tools. And then as soon as you're done using a tool for the last time, you throw it away, throw it away from the desk. And mind you, I say throw away and not put away because the point here is not putting things back to their place. The point here is just keeping the desk clean and tidy. So anything that is not needed goes out immediately. And that is of course very efficient from the point of view if you, if you consider how clean the desk will look like, but it's difficult to implement. You have to remember to do it. And it adds a whole um, layer of complexity to the process of coding a program. Other languages, on the other hand, they manage memory for you automatically. There's a process called garbage collector, and this runs periodically and cleans up all variables, objects, and all the memory that is not used anymore. And to go back to our analogy again, this is as if you had a helper, someone standing behind you and just watching and waiting for you to stop doing something. As soon as you stop doing whatever it is that you're doing for even just a second, it, jump, it jumps in and it tries to figure out what it is that you don't need anymore and throw it away. So 
Regardless of how memory is managed, whether it's done ma manually or automatically, it's always done in three steps. The first step is, is uh, memory allocation. This is where we reserve the chunk of memory and store, da uh, and store data in it. Oh, this is where we reserve the memory, sorry. Then we have the read and write operations. And this is where we write, store something in the memory and we access it, we read it, we write it. And then the last step is memory deallocation. It, this is when we don't need the memory anymore and we free it up. Before we go into these steps specifically, there is one important but quick distinction that we need to make. And that is that in JavaScript, we have two uh, types of data, primitives and non-primitives. Primitives are numbers, strings, booleans, value null, and undefined. They are immutable. And that means that once they're stored in memory, they cannot be changed. They can only be deleted or ignored. And non-primitives are, you guessed it, they are anything that is not a primitive. So objects, arrays, or functions. And these are mutable. So with that out of the way, let's look at memory allocation. So the JavaScript engine splits the memory that it has available for use in two areas, the memory stack and the memory heap. And here, I would like to quickly point out that while the memory stack is called a stack because of the data structure that is used to implement it, the heap has nothing to do with the binary heap. Just a heads up, it has nothing to do uh, with the binary heap. Don't imagine it that way. It's like a bucket of memory. So the memory stack is used to store stack frames. Uh, stack frames are created every time we run a function and all information relative to the context of that function is stored in the frame. Variables, the this context, what line are we currently running, everything. And the amount of memory needed for each stack frame is not at compile time and it, is, uh, it does not grow. So that means that stack is fixed size. The memory heap on the other hand is the portion of memory that is not fixed and it's used to store complex uh, objects such as um, objects and arrays as well as any variable, even if it's uh, primitive, any variable that is, we don't know the size of or the type of at, time of, uh, at the time of initialization. So let's look at the code snippet and see how memory allocation works in the stack. Say that we have this piece of code right here and we have three functions, very simple functions, print greeting and print name. They both uh, create a, var a variable, which is a string and they both assign it a value and then uh, print it, console log it. And in this example, we only have primitive values. Would we run line 16? When we run line 16, the first thing to run is print greeting. Print greeting uh, is a stack frame is created and it is put on the stack. The stack frame will contain all information about uh, this function. And for the sake of simplicity, I'm only uh, putting variables on here, but there's a lot more like we mentioned. So we allocate some space randomly in the memory stack. In this case, it's M15 and M15 holds the value hello, and the, the variable greeting points to this cell in memory. And then it gets uh, accessed and console logged, and then it gets popped off the stack and it disappears. The stack disappears and the function disappears from the stack frame. The same happens for the next function, print name, a new completely random piece of memory gets allocated and this, this time it's M08. It gets uh, console logged, accessed, and then popped off the stack. So when spa space is allocated, space is, uh, the value is written and then it's accessed by whatever function. Once it's done running, the stack, the function gets popped off the stack and the memory is freed. Let's look at an example with the heap instead. Here we have the same print greeting function. It works exactly the same. The only difference here is that print name has changed and now it declares a variable uh, called person and assigns to it an object instead of a string. And as you can see here, greeting works exactly the same. Allocate, use, pop off. But what, what happens with print name instead with the object is that since it's not a primitive, it cannot be stored directly on the stack. So what happens is a piece of memory randomly again gets allocated on the memory heap. This time it's H00. The object gets put in there a reference to that H00 it put, is put in the memory stack and the person variable is pointed to M04. 
So it's like a chain of connection. It's like pointers pointing to each other. The variable points to H00, uh, points to M04, and M04 points to H00. And when we finish using it, it gets popped off the stack, but this is interesting. Only the stack gets wiped. The memory heap does not. We will come back to this later. So all variables are in a way or another stored in the stack. If they're primitives, their value is directly stored. If, if they're not primitives, a uh, reference to, the, to their address and the heap is stored instead. So this is also why the reason why variables are handled differently, they're handled by, uh, by value if they're primitives or by reference if they're objects. Let's look at an example again. Here we are making a, um, uh, a variable, first num, we give it a value 35, and then we declare a second va uh, variable, second num, and we set it to be equal to first num. So second num equals first num. And then when we console log the two and we print them, as you can see uh, below, in the first console log, they're both 35. What does that mean? That means we, have, we are storing the 35 into one cell, but we are pointing both um, variables to that same cell. So both variables pointing to M13. But let's look at line five. When we set first num to be equal to 50 and then and we console log again, both variables, as you can see from the second log, only first num has changed and second num has not changed. Why does that happen? That happens because primitives are immutable. Like we mentioned, primitives are immutable. Immutable means that we cannot go into a cell, M13, for example, and just change, it, uh, change its value. We cannot do that. We can create another uh, cell. We can do whatever we want with other pieces of memory, but we can't go in there and change the 35 to be 50. So what happens when we say first num is equal to 50? In actuality, what happens is we make, uh, we reserve a new uh, slot of space uh, in the memory stack. In this case, it's M21. Uh, and then we set first num to point to this uh, slot of memory. And we never really explicitly changed second num. Second num is still pointing to M13. And that is why when we log the two uh, variables, they have different values. This works slightly differently with objects though. In this example, for ex uh, in this example, we're making an object. Uh, it's OBJ, but I'll just refer to it as first object. It has, uh, it's an object that has a name and an age. And then we create second object and we set it to be equal to first object. So far, so good. So far, it's the same as the primitives. And when we console log the two, as you can see from the console on the right, they are exactly the same. This, uh, the concept is also the same. We have the, the the object stored in the memory heap, H11. A reference to it is stored in the memory stack, in this case, uh, randomly again in M05. And then both objects point to that uh, M05, which in turn points to H11. And, but watch what happens here. When we change the value of the name and the H properties of first object, uh, and we print both objects again, they are both the same, they both change, unlike what happened with primitives. And this is because non-primitives are mutable, which means we can go into the memory heap and change the cell. We can just change the content of H11 to change it to be equal to, in this case, name is equal to Musin and H28. We never really moved the pointer from the memory stack, which means they both still point to the same object, to the same, to the same changed of the object this time around. So we have seen memory allocation, we have seen memory access, and let's wrap it up with memory deallocation. What is memory deallocation? Memory deallocation is um, when we free memory, when we release memory, when we don't need it anymore. We access, we use, pop off the stack, we don't need that piece of memory. The things in the stack uh, get removed, but the things in the heap are not removed. Deallocating memory so uh, is done automatically in JavaScript, like we've seen, and it's done with the garbage collector. What is the garbage collector, or rather, what is garbage collection in general, and how does it work? So, garbage collection is a mechanism that allows the interpreter to scan for memory 
and values that, it, that are not needed anymore and remove them to free up memory. The problem though, is that figuring out what is needed and what is not is an undecidable problem. That means that a machine cannot tell with 100% accuracy what is needed and what is not needed any, anymore. That is only the only, uh, only humans can do that with 100% uh, accuracy when we write code. So in order to determine what object is not needed anymore, to approximate rather, to approximate what is needed and what is not needed anymore, the JavaScript engine uses an algorithm called mark and sweep. And the way this algorithm works is it basically, it starts at the root of the, of the memory. It starts at the root of the program and it traverses all the memory heap. And it goes from one object to, an, to the other, all objects that are reachable. It goes from one object to the other and it marks them just like that. And you can see that some, some dots in there are disconnected. That happens when we pop, for example, a function is popped off the stack and the reference to the heap is popped off the stack as well because the memory stack gets wiped completely. But the memory heap, the, the, the piece, the object or the array uh, or the function is still in the memory heap. It doesn't get removed. And what happens is that they're still there, just floating in memory, um, not used. In here, what, what we mean by undecidable problem is that one of these green, set, one of these greens, uh, green pieces of memory that are being marked as uh, reachable, they could be um, unneeded anymore. They could be um, marked as blue and be removed as well. But the computer cannot tell that. So if something is reachable, if something is, uh, is connected to something that is currently being used, to the eyes of the computer, that is something that is uh, still in use. So by the time this operation is done running, everything that is marked is kept in memory. And anything that is not marked, meaning that it was unreachable, gets sweeped and gets uh, completely uh, removed from memory, freeing up its space and making it available for use again. Okay, so that was it. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And please, you can, uh, you can reach out. Please do reach out uh, at GitHub or LinkedIn or Medium, where I plan to go a little bit more in detail. And I, play it, I plan to write uh, a few articles and go a little bit more in depth about this subject. Thank you very much.